right, today at Blue Glow Electronics we've got a Thorin's TD-135 turntable here on the bench and we're going to do kind of a uh, quick run through on this one as we restore it. I don't have time to do an in-depth video series on this, but uh, we'll try to hit the highlights and what we're going to do. I tell you now, it's interesting, uh, I took the platter off of this thing and uh, this, uh, the bear, the whale and the uh, bone dry, not a, not an ounce of, uh, of lubrication there. So uh, we're going to start with that and uh, got to put a new uh, idler wheel on it. We've got new belts. Uh, we're going to clean and polish the whole thing. I do have to fix the arm on it here. You notice, let me, let me drop the, uh, the arm down on the camera here and you can see it much better. Notice how the arms on these, and by the way, these are a fixed arm. They cannot be replaced. Uh, that's the main difference between this and the TD-124 is really the bearing oil and uh, the tone arm is fixed on this, this type of table. But you notice how this is sagging back here on the back end. It kind of goes straight and then it's sagging down. I've uh, I picked up a piece, so I'm going to have to take this arm apart and uh, fix that so it's not sagging. Okay, we've kind of taken the little set screw off here. And now you can get the idler wheel off, and these things are hard as a brick. Um, there's no uh, there's no flexibility to this rubber whatsoever anymore. So definitely time to replace this. And we've gone ahead and loosened this screw up right here, which lets this little uh, cover pull over. And then at that point, you can kind of pull the belt off of the bottom pulley in this. And we're going to polish both of these pulleys up because I can see they've got uh, some residue and wear on them. And we've got a new belt to replace this with. Okay, one thing I'm noticing is uh, when you plug it in and turn it on, the motor does not turn. And I can barely turn the motor. I mean, it is super, super tight. Um, this has the E50 motor on it, just like the, um, the TD-124. That's one of the beauties of this. So we're going to have to rebuild that motor. Um, no way around it. Okay, as you flip it over, uh, yes, you can see it's pretty simple simplistic. This is the, the E50 motor that we're going to rebuild. Um, we've also got a cap over here we're going to replace um, and then we'll just lubricate everything underneath. It's got a little bit of oxidation going on over here. Um, but they're, they're really not tough turntables to work on. The same with the TD-124s. The biggest thing you see with the TD-124s, people spend a lot of time on these bearings and making sure that everything with the platter is just in line. Um, using micrometers and whatnot um, to try to reduce any amount of vibration in the uh, platter. This bearing well setup is not quite like the uh, TD-124s, not quite as eccentric, um, but nonetheless still a nice table. So I'm going to start on getting this motor going. Similarly here on the motor shaft, you've got a set screw on either side. You have to kind of turn the motor so you can get a fun precision screwdriver of some sort in from the side over here and kind of turn it. Once you do that will come off. Up next you'll want to remove these three E-clips right here and they'll have rubber grommets underneath one, each one of those. Make sure when you're removing an E-clip use a screwdriver on one side like this or get a pair of pliers made for E-clips um, but boy put your fingers on top of it and hold that thing down because they will shoot across the room and then you'll spend um, hours if not days searching for them. Let me find a screwdriver right about the right size here. There we go. Once you get it off then you kind of always magnetic um, little tray to hold all your parts. Okay once you get the motor mounts out um, and I started taking off the screws to hold this plate to the motor but then you can uh, remove this little plate right here with two screws that that came out. Um, and what you're going to want to undo is unsolder the wires going to the motor. But you're going to want to make sure you get your camera out and take a good picture of that so you know where they go back. We're probably going to replace these wires coming out of the motor as well. Okay, once you get the other two screws out of the cover then, you can lift it off. You can see this bearing here <laughs> completely dried up and seized uh, or bushing. Um, and we have to end up drilling these out and putting a uh, new bushing back in here. And we have to use um, some rivets to put it back together. But boy, as you can see here, this thing is just uh, really, really seized up. Look at this. <laughs> it's bearing in here. I can barely turn this. I mean, it is uh, 
is just all dried up, seized up. It looks like this table has been in dampness for a long time. So it's just drawn a lot of uh, oxidization. And uh, I don't know. Looks like maybe it's just sat for years and years. I don't know the real history behind this table, but I don't think it's been used much in the last probably 30 years. All right, I thought I'd show you some of the parts I bought for this. So this is the counterweight support, uh, the plastic piece. Uh, it's about a $40 part. I'm guessing somebody is 3D printing those. Um, bought a Thacker um, original um, turntable belt here for this. Uh, it's the exact right one you want. That's about $35-$40. Um, this, I bought a kit from a guy in Italy, Audio Salento here. This is has everything you need. It has the two new uh, bushings here, uh, centered bushings. It has all the rivets you're going to need to put it back together. It has all the right um, bushings and, I mean, uh, um, bearing felt and whatnot. I also got um, a set of rubber um, that will actually go on to this. I can cut it open. It would be the new, that's what's going to replace um, the idler wheel here. So kind of a different approach to the idler wheel. Um, that's like uh, $370, close to $400 worth of parts, I believe it is. <laughs> believe it or not. Um, so. Restoring one of these is not a cheap venture right out of the gate. Um, you'll have some money in the parts alone, plus a good bit of later labor. And a good um, set of uh, mushroom um, you know, that goes on the, uh, the adjustments here and uh, the suspension between this and the plinth. Okay, let's call this before. And I've done the other side now at this point. And this would be after. I've got the new centered bushing down in here. Uh, new rivets back in it. Uh, you basically have to drill these out, pull this out. There's a little washer pad that goes in or felt uh, washer that goes in there. You put the center bushing back in it, um, put it back together. Uh, you have to tap the both sides and uh, get your rivets put back together. But turns out really nice when uh, when done properly. So before I could barely turn this, like took all my force to turn it. Um, check this out. Quite a difference at this point. Okay, we've got the motor all put bit together. Everything's spinning nice and freely here, just as it should. Okay, we've gone from motor that I couldn't even turn to now one that spins extremely freely to motor that runs. Super quiet. Uh, I'm very impressed with this thing. I've also polished this this wheel here as well, just using a polishing wheel. A little bit of polishing compound, but uh, smooth as glass at this point. I am happy right now. I just turned it off. This thing just continues to spin and spin and spin and spin and spin. Okay, up next we're going to focus on what I'll call the drooping arm. Uh, the, the counterweight here, if you just take this screw out the back, then the counterweight will slip off. And then at that point there's these little lock nuts here that hold the bearings in place on both sides that you're going to have to take off because we're going to end up having to pull these two bearings in ends out far enough to lift this top cover cap off. Up next these are the uh, little cover screws here that hold them on. One on each side on the bottom. Teeny little screw here in the top cover that will let you take the top plate off. And boy please don't lose that screw. It would be tough to replace and you just got to lift that up. Alright, I did not pull this all the way out because there's a connection from this top piece that goes down into a little lever and I've just kind of left it intact and set it off to the side because it's this screw right here that ultimately I'm trying to get to. Um, this is what will let us um, remove this back piece that we, we need to here. And then this just pulls out. And this is the whole issue right here. That this used to be a rubber grommet in between here, and this rubber is just completely gone at this point, and it lets it bend over like that. Just 
teeny little e-clip on this end so you have to get a small 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 screwdriver of some sort and get that little e-clip off and I'm gonna put the camera up so I don't end up actually I got it here didn't want to lose that get that into the magnetic container At that point this should pull out and uh, maybe I have to work with it a little bit yeah, the way this thing was bent down you would have thought this rod was bent but it's actually not you can see how it's bent down there when you pull this off you can see it's just that the rubber is that that shot and this is the new part I'm gonna end up cleaning all this oxidation off first but we will replace it with this uh, piece of hardened plastic instead of that uh, soft rubber and there we go we've replaced it um, I actually think it looks pretty good and uh, went together quite well and uh, not drooping so I won't have that issue again okay we've got it back together now you end up having to put these two bearings in and align it with the uh, the little points that it connects on to here on the tone arm the pivot points and um, you end up having to get it make sure you got it centered left to right here and then you have to kind of make sure that you've got um, got just the right amount you don't want any back and forth movement when you wiggle your arm and you hold this steel but yet at the same time you want very free movement here up and down and there's a balance between those two you can get it you can hear that you can get it where it's too free up and down and then you have that movement left and right which you don't want that's about perfect fully free right there and no back and forth and we put the little uh, screw in the cap back in we tightened up these nuts really good here and then what we make sure of is that we haven't lost anything so good and uh, free up and down hold this no back and forth we should be good to go and last here we've got to put the uh, the tone arm weight back on I know I make this stuff look pretty simple um, but I, I can tell you, just fixing this thing, uh, this counterweight suspension alone, it was an hour's worth of work. Let me drop the camera down now. And as you can see here, no more sag, yay! Um, and that should be fixed for life because that hard plastic piece will last a lot longer than the, the rubber piece that was on there. Okay, when I originally ordered all the parts for this table, which has been two or three months ago, um, I thought these were included in the kit um, for the motor, but they were not. So um, I've ordered some more of these. I'm going to pause for the weekend. And by the time they, sh they should be here by next weekend, and we'll be good to go. Okay, while I'm waiting on that, I can focus on this wheel. It has its own wheel bearing, and I'll have to flip the table over and uh, get that out and uh, clean and polish it up. Insane. I pulled the... Uh, the bottom of this um, has both a uh, adjustable kind of stop for the for the pulley um, as well as a lock nusher for it. completely bone dry and uh, you can see here not an ounce of uh, a drop of lubricant anywhere so we're going to have to oil that and get it back together similar to the center bushings you've got um pull this e-clip and a little washer and then under it is a felt pad here that is bone dry so uh, you can see the belt um, the felt here then seeps oil down into this to keep it lubricated so we're going to clean all that real good and uh, lubricate it okay I'm polishing the platter now I, I cleaned the rubber mat on top uh, but it, you see it's just super dull at this point and I've been doing a little bit of cleaning here on this side and you can see it's just pretty much to a mirror finish. Um, what I use is a little bit of this stuff called wind oil. It's uh, just in a little toothpaste type container. And I use 4 out steel wool and I uh, use it to apply it. And you just kind of, it's a lot of elbow grease and a lot of rubbing. You'll spend, if you do it right, you spend about an hour doing a platter like this. Um, and you want to keep applying the stuff to your to your steel wool, kind of rub it around a little bit. You don't want to do it dry. And you just keep rubbing, buffing, buffing. 
there's no simple quick way to this because you got to get the layer of oxidation off first. Once you get all that done, then you can go over to a buffing wheel um, and kind of polish it up to a real mirror finish. But you can't start with the buffing wheel and get all this oxidization off. Check that out. Looking great. All right. When you get it all done, you can uh, use a polishing cloth some. Make sure you get off all the old residue. But uh, you see this thing's looking great. Um, I had to take a break. My arms got... <laughs> Arms got tired and I started sweating and uh, and my hands started cramping. 45-50 uh, minutes of non-stop rubbing will do that. Um, up next, so you want the outer part here to look good. This doesn't matter as much, you never see it. But the inner part here of this platter is where the idler wheel goes around. And so you want to get that nice and polished. Um, you do not want oxidation on that or, uh, or you'll actually be able to hear it. Okay, on this, you don't have to go for the same mirror finish that you did on the outer edge, but you just want to make sure it's nice and clean and smooth as glass. If you run your finger around, finger around this and feel anything, you're going to want to get rid of that. And while we're still waiting on the, uh, the rubber grommets here, I'm going to go ahead and use, I like this Zymol. It's a cleaner wax, so it's got a little bit of abrasive to it to get off the old... Um, kind of layer of crud but then it uh, does a nice job waxing. There's lots of options you can use. I usually apply it with a little uh, either a paper towel or a um, I've got some pads made just for applying um, wax and then I use a uh, you know like a polishing cloth like you would use on a car to get the wax off with and that's what we're gonna do. Interesting on these tables same as the 124s um, they were they were not always um, I would say painted to the finish that a car may be at the factory. Yet a lot of people want to see these things polished up and look like a car finish. I mean, they, they come out looking really good, but in the case of this one, you can actually see back in here just slightly where when they painted this table, they didn't quite get it um, a full coating on there. So you can see just a slight bit of primer underneath here. Um, really no way to fix that other than I've polished the paint on top of it. But in general, this, this table is going to turn out to be perfect. I just, I've seen people take these and want them to look immaculate and without doing a full strip down and repaint. And I know a guy that does that. It's about 320 bucks to get one, uh, to get one painted at an automotive place. So, uh, pretty good investment. You gotta, gotta make sure you want to go there. Or some guys with the 124s do. Okay, we got in our rubber grommets to replace these. Gonna go ahead and put those in. Here we've got the new grommets in. You just have to kind of work them from the bottom and work them around. Take a minute or so to put each one in. And then we just put the three washers back on and the three E-clips here that hold the motor in place. The motor's designed to have a little bit of wiggle here. That's what these rubber bushings are for. Uh, it's all part of uh, kind of a uh, dampened suspension here on this. Okay, when it comes to putting this back together, there's two different colored screws and one's longer than the other. The black goes on this side and it has to hold down this little um, kind of um, strain relief as well as uh, the ground goes underneath this one here um, that goes up to the motor. And uh, at that point, you should have the motor all mounted back in place as well as the little uh, voltage selector here. Okay, up next here, I'm going to take this screw loose, which I've just done. I'm going to kind of spin this out of the way, and I'm going to replace this uh, motor cap here. Okay, we've got the capacitor uninstalled. Uh, it's a 10,000 picofarad at 400 working volts, otherwise known as a 0.01 microfarad. And this is a uh, 103K at 630 volts, so uh, 0.01 microfarad. So we're going to get this installed over here. And it just goes between these two sections here, so that'll be easy to solder in. I'm just using a Panasonic uh, polycap. They do really good for this. Uh, orange drop or whatever else would work as well. And as you can see, I've got my little polycap now uh, soldered across those two terminals. Now comes the fun. We're going to put this back together here. Um, hang on a second. Put this back together. Right here, there we go. And now we've got to uh, 
change out these uh, tone arm cables. These things are horrific. Uh, they're the original factory units and the ends of them are just, um, as you can see here, just kind of <laughs> not up to today's specs by any means. So we're going to swap these out and I'll show you what we're going to do that with. Okay, I get these cables here from a guy in Greece. They, um, they're Mongami cables. He does a really good job of putting really nice ends on them. And always have him, you can select which type of uh, end lug you want here. And then you can tell him what you want on the other end. So you can tell him, hey, I want um, a 9-pin uh, den mount on the other end. Or you could tell him you wanted, in this case, just wires, which we're going to end up uh, wiring into here. And um, a set of these, this guy uh, custom makes these. I can uh, put a link for this down in the uh, description. But a set of these shipped from Greece about $75, uh, depending a little bit on what you put on the other end here. But uh, they're some of the best cables I've ever used. Okay, I had to little, do a little reverse engineering here. Um, you've got these RCA cable, the white one that goes to one and two. And the center goes on one, so we can mark that over here, center and shield. And then if we notice on this, three on the gray goes to center and shield. What I did is I pulled up the, um, let me see, I'm just writing this down here. On the, I pulled this uh, the service manual or the owner's manual for this table on um, online and um, lo and behold it's in French so I can't read a word on there. So what I did was I looked up uh, the picture that showed how this was wired and um, I just used Google Translate to kind of translate some of the words and what I found was here pins 1 and 2 on this are the left channel and 3 and 4 are the right channel so at that point now we can uh, we know we can unsolder this because we know the uh, left channel will be right and the white channel will be red here, right channel will be red here. And we'll just wire it up the same way, center conductor, outer conductor, center conductor, outer conductor. And then there'll be a last one that goes all the way over here, if you can see, to a little ground lug um, right here. And that will be, um, that'll be our cable sheet. For my workshop area, I use just a little ISO tip um, portable rechargeable soldering iron. and. Um, does a really good job for this kind of stuff. Um, it's, it's not quite bench grade, um, but for the things I'm doing like this, it's really handy to keep it in here. And it's uh, not tied to a cord, so I can carry it about anywhere and do things like this. And as you can see here, it all unsoldered really nicely. And now we just gotta kinda make sure we've got enough length in here, and we'll end up using the same strain relief hold down that goes um, right here, um, tied in with that button. And we'll, uh, we'll get this ran over and uh, kind of solder it in. And since I don't know which color wires go to uh, which leads at this point, I'm just going to get an ohm meter and uh, kind of call it ohm these out or uh, use continuity test to make sure I mark all those down. All right, I did just that. I used my little uh, multimeter set on continuity here and mapped it out. The center of the left is clear. The uh, shield is blue, the center of the right is red, and the uh, shield is small black. There's a large black wire on here, but that's actually uh, kind of your chassis ground, and that's the one we'll end up tying over here. And as you can see, we've got them all soldered on now, and what I'll do is just kind of fold this over then and put this here, put this across, and uh, tighten it down, and we are good to go. Okay, I did have to insert a little bit of a shim right here as I tighten this down because this, uh, this single cable is a little thinner than the, the two original cables bundled together that went through there, but that, uh, that snugged it up. Okay, well, I've still got the table upside down. I like to use uh, Super Lube. It's a uh, PTFE uh, synthetic grease. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and lubricate any moving parts underneath this table. It will... Uh, you know, just make things operate smoother, and this stuff will last for uh, many, many years. Okay, we got the whole bottom lubricated, and I've just turned it over, and I've been working things just to uh, kind of activate things and move them around a little bit. And it's time to go ahead and get um, a new idler wheel on and a new belt and whatnot. 
All right, we've got the idler wheel on at this point, got the belt on. The one thing you want to check then is go through all your speed settings, and this should reside on uh, the idler wheel right in the middle of the top notch. Then you go to 33, it should sit in the middle of the second notch. Go to 45, it should sit in the middle of the third notch, and 78 all the way down here on the bottom. If it's not sitting in the middle of each of those notches, then um, the bolt that we had taken out on the bottom down here um, for the the, um, the spindle for this, uh, there's a nut under the bottom of it you can adjust up or down that will ultimately raise or lower the height of this that would affect uh, what you're doing there. So fortunately this one turned out just right. Let's plug it in. So over here on 16 You'll notice how slow this idler wheel is turning. I'm only holding it over to keep it from hitting the side over here. Normally the platter would do that. And you can see it's spinning at 33 RPM there. And as we go to 45. And as we go to 78, it gets really fast. Thing is super, super, super quiet in all these settings. Um, I'm happy with how it's turning out. Okay, we've got the platter on it. Turn it to 33, and it starts spinning. 45, 78. Takes a minute for uh, for it to get up to the right speed. But, and let's go all the way. If you put on zero here, you can stop it, and then 16 would be really slow transcription speed here. 33 would be, oops, that's on zero. 33 would be uh, typical LP speeds and uh, seems to be doing good. Okay, I don't know if you can see it or not, but the center on this is white. It turns green when you're at 33 RPM. Um, and it's white because it's the 31.95. So the way this works on these Thorns tables is this center little star here in the middle of this speed control knob, as you turn it, which is not always easy to to do. It is the uh, pitch control. And as you notice, I, I turned it, and now we're right where we should be at 33 and one third RPM. 33.3 right there, dead on the spot. So uh, that's exactly what it needed. If you notice, 45 is locked dead on as well. By the way, this is an app called RPM. It's about two dollars on uh, the app store and it's uh, amazing for what you're doing here because not only does it track the speed but it also tracks wow and flutter in a little oscilloscope screen down here on the bottom. Uh, you can't see it now because it's scrolled off but um, you can uh, you can tell how consistently whether the table's speeding up slowing down or how consistently it's turning and uh, you can kind of see it a little bit there maybe. But uh, this thing's locked dead on at this point. One thing I'll warn you about, do not put it on 78 and put your phone on here. It'll sling your phone right off uh, into the floor. I've done it and a friend of mine has done it recently. Okay, let's talk about how the motor switch um, works on these units. It's a little different than the TD-124, so if, if you're going back and forth between this and a TD-124, it would be a little confusing. But the way it works, if you put this on stop, what you do is you lift the tone arm up and you move it to the right. That actually turns the table spinning. Um, then you would basically drop your needle, your record would play through. When it gets all the way to the end here, to past the run out groove, it would shut off the motor and the platter and you would move this back over here and put it up. If you are storing your turntable, you know, you might not be playing it for a month, switch it over to zero here. Uh, it'll keep the uh, idler wheel from sitting against the wheel and creating a flat spot on it. Um, manual is just a little bit different here. Um, the way manual works, oops, sometimes you have to spin the platter a little bit to get it to go over on manual because the, the catch lever here that was uh, cutting the table off still was engaged. But you would do the thing where you turn it on by moving it over to the right. You drop your needle, it would play through. It will not shut off when it gets to the runoff groove then. You would have to bring it over here and you would have to manually flip this over to the stop position. Um, so most people just leave it on the uh, kind of stop function there. You would uh, sometimes you have to spin it just a little bit to get it off of that uh, flip point. Table will turn on, drop your needle, it'll play through. 
gets to the run out groove, table will turn off. You can move your needle back over and store it. Then again, if you're going to be storing it for any length of time, turn it to zero here. It removes the idler wheel off of the inner part of the platter and uh, gets rid of the uh, any possibilities of a flat spot on your idler wheel. This, these, uh, these round um, um, bushing type, um, they work much, much better than the flat ones uh, as far as that goes. At this point, this table is done, other than I want to go back over it cosmetically because I've been touching the platter with, with greasy hands. So I want to repolish it one time. I, I want to make sure I get this toner on good and clean. And I want to clean this, uh, this black um, platter mat here just one more time. And uh, this thing will be ready to go back to the customer. One other thing, this thing has an old uh, cartridge on it and uh, no, no stylus, so it's an old Stanton cartridge. Um, we've got a, uh, a Denon uh, 103 we're going to put into this unit, so I'm going I'm to go to the workbench and do that. Okay, a little bit of an issue we've ran into with this head shell. The tone arm on this is a BTD-12S, and this is the original black factory head shell that came with it. And uh, this little plate mounts in the top of it here, and a screw holds it in place here. And then it's got two little short screws that you mount the cartridge to. And it's made for the older style cartridges this head shell is. The ones that are fairly large in size, um, something like this Empire 88, 880 here. Um, you can see how tall it is and how it would stick down below the depth here of this head shell. Um, as well as you can see how thin the mounting bracket is here and it would go in here inside of these screws which are not very long. Well, when you try to mount a modern head shell like, or a cartridge like this uh, Denon 103 here, um, you can notice it is, uh, one, not very deep compared to the overall depth, especially if I take off the uh, little plastic cover here. It's not very deep compared to the overall um, depth of an older cartridge. And two, the mounting um, bracket, instead of it being real thin here, is quite substantially longer. You've got to have screws that would go um, all the way from the bottom all the way up to about where this green tip ends right here to mount. And these screws, one, are not long enough, and two, if you mount this in here um, flat on that plate, um, you can't even get, the stylus will not even protrude below this head shell. So there's a couple options I've thrown back at the uh, owner of this table that we could do. One uh, guy in Italy sells uh, um, or Shopper AD, uh, Scrapper AD sells um, some spacers that would go into this um, and then would hold this uh, would hold this head shell down a little bit like this right here so you could actually see it and you'd need about five or six millimeters to do that and then you'd also need some longer screws and unfortunately he doesn't sell them um, I'd have to get these from another person that uh, on uh, ebay.de that sells these uh, these are not a standard two and a half, two point five millimeter. They're uh, they're actually two millimeter screws. Um, so that's one option. The second option would be to replace this whole head shell with a, uh, a TP50 head shell, which is a uh, original Thorin's, and even some of the later model BTS uh, BT, BTD. 12S head shell, um, tone arms came with the TP50 head shell on it instead of this one, some of the later models. And they also uh, sell newer versions of the TP50 head shell that is designed basically um, on the top to hold two and a half uh, millimeter screws. The, the, the beauty of, the, of, the, uh, of that head shell is it gives you much more uh, fine adjustments on the overhang and VTA both, where this one's kind of pretty fixed. As you can see, there's not a lot of adjustment to it. So I'm going to wait and see what the uh, customer comes back with on that. But uh, that's probably a couple weeks in the making at this point because uh, if I order anything from overseas, I'll have to wait on it to get here. So I'll probably go ahead and wrap this video up even without the, uh, the, the cartridge finalized here. Okay, we're going to call this video a wrap. Uh, I'm still working on this, uh, what we're going to do about this head shell, but uh, that's a, a minor thing. And um, as you can see here, got the new uh, Mongami um, 
leads on this thing. It uh, seems to be working great. Um, I actually like this table a whole lot. I like the way it turns on. I like the uh, shutoff mechanism. Um, i turn it off that way. The platter cleaned up really well. The uh, rubber slip mat, I used a little bit of uh, what they call uh, black, back to black I think it is, um, that you get at an uh, auto parts store. I try not to use the silicone stuff because then it leaves a residue on your slip mat, but uh, that back to black stuff works out really well. And uh, like I said, when you're not using it, you leave it there on the uh, on zero but really happy with how this table turned out hope you guys learned something hope you enjoyed the video and uh, we've had a lot of fun with it thanks for watching everyone